All right, let's continue here. Our code so far is 14 lines of code. It's a fully functional and compliant website. Remember, our first project is going to be a website, a web app. Then it's going to be an Android slash iPhone app in month two. So we're striving toward the web app at this point. And what we're doing is we're writing modern standards compliant HTML5. And part of the compliance is that notice all of our tags are lowercase. Everything here is lowercase. If you typed it uppercase, it should still work, but it's technically not standards compliant. If you were using, if you were making websites uh, a few years ago, you might have been using HTML4, or you might have been using the offshoot XHTML, and on that one, oftentimes the code was uppercase. But we're using it modernly, so make sure your code is lowercase. If it's not at the moment, just continue it and make it lowercase. So this is our code so far. Let's write a little bit more. Let's add a little bit more code here. We've written code that creates text. Let's um, look at adding a picture and such. Let's go to line 12 and then enter so you can get a new line 13. Let's create a brand new line 13. We're going to create another paragraph group, another pair of paragraphs. So write the P tags again, lines 13 to 15. And in this new paragraph, we're going to write inside the paragraph, let's write my name. And then below it, I want to add my picture. I want to add my I want to add code to add my picture. Now I said below it. So do you simply press enter? No. Not quite. We have to also add this break tag like we did up here. We wrote this, we pressed enter, but we also needed the break tag to break that line. So add the break tag at the end of line 14 so that we can break the line, br, break. Then press enter to line 15. And on line 15, we're going to write the image tag. Now image tag, it's got the same sort of concept, opening and closing like that, and it's going to be simply img. So a few things about this. It's the image tag. It does not have a pair. So it's just a single tag like that, and it's spelled I-M-G, not I-M-A-G-E, just I-M-G. That's the image tag. But that's not enough to tell the web browser what image. It needs an attribute, similar to what we did up here, meta. Well, which meta tag? The car set attribute, specifically UTF-8. So we need something similar in that syntax for an image. So inside of the image tag, right before the closing right uh, angle bracket, press space right there. We'll write the attribute src equals quote, end quote. We're saying here the source of our picture. Where's our picture? If we had um, let me show you this. I've got on my flash drive a folder for my project, and on my flash drive, there's my work right there. On my flash drive, I've got today's work saved right there. On our code here, if I had a picture in the same folder as that HTML file, I would simply write the code of the name of the picture, victor.jpg, for example if I had a picture in the same folder. I don't have a picture there. What I could do, though, is I could write a web address here. I could write http colon slash slash victor.com slash victor.jpg. That would work as well. If I, type a, if I type a fully formed web address to a picture, that works as well. I've got a picture, so don't type anything yet. I've got a picture um, for you that you can use, or you can use your own picture, but I've got a picture for you on my website that we'll borrow. Let's open a web browser on one of my websites. Let's go to your web browser and let's go to vmcink.net. There's a little picture of me 
on the, on that website. And what we'll do is we will either copy the code to that picture, or we will save that file to our disk. I'll show you how in a moment. vmcinc.net. You'll see one of my websites. You will see my picture right here. Right-click my picture. Now, this is going to depend. I'm in Firefox. And in Firefox, if I right-click my picture, it says copy image location. If you're in Chrome, it'll say something else. Maybe copy web address, copy address. link. What's that? Image address. Copy image address. So in your web browser, I'm copying the image location or address or whatever. I could also click Save As. I could save that picture into the same folder as my HTML file. I'm going to copy it from the website back to my code. In the quotes, right click paste. And look at that, it puts in that huge address for that picture. VMSync.net slash asset slash images slash new slash new capital slash Instagram underscore to the So I didn't want you to type that. You just copy that from the website. And this will work because it's a fully formed web address to a picture that exists online. Let's check it out. Save it and run it. You should see my picture on your web page. Did everyone get my picture on your web page? Yes. Is there any limitations as far as how big a picture an image can be uh, with HTML? No, not really. Um, you can have a huge, you know, image, a huge raw image that I get out of, straight from my camera, sure. That might not be the most efficient, however. So for all intents and purposes, no, there's no real limit. But once we get to doing this seriously, we'll, I'll give you recommendations on sizes and such. Um, this works really well, but is there any down, downsides or drawbacks to doing this? Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. What if I take my picture down? What if my website crashes? So if you're relying on my picture on my server and there's a problem with my server, your website suffers. So we'll leave it as is here, but just make a note that this is one drawback of hot linking to someone else's content. They could take the content down. They could rename the file. They could rename it simply as victorpicture.jpg and then the link breaks. This is not smart enough to automatically fix the link itself. So perhaps a better thing would be to download the file and keep it locally. Um, but we'll, this is fine for us at this point. So I got my picture. And in around 19, I think it was like 1992, 1991 or so, the first JPEG was put online on, on the web. You can still look it up. It's uh, kind of funny because uh, it's actually a group of four female singers. They call themselves like the Cernettes. Do you know what Cern is? C-E-R-N? Um, Cern, it's a uh, research facility in Europe. And these were a group of four female scientists that used to do karaoke together. They took a photo together and their first, first picture on the web was of them. You can actually look it up. It's pretty interesting. So we are doing what they did 20 years ago, 25 years ago. We are writing the code to do this. And the fascinating thing about all of this that we're doing is this language of HTML, invented in around 1989, so it's 27 years old. The web is 27 years old. The internet is older. It's from the 60s. But the web is a piece of the internet. The web is 27 years old. In this language, HTML was invented by, uh, by a student in, uh, in Europe, uh, Tim Berners-Lee. He invented this language based on another language, put it out there to the world. He didn't copyright it. He didn't trademark it. He didn't lock it down. He didn't patent it and get rich off of it. He gave it away free to the world. And honestly, without any exaggeration, this is one of the most important inventions in humanity given away. Think about the websites that you visit your banking that you do, 
connecting with friends and family, uh, learning something new on Wikipedia, watching cat videos, all the important stuff, right? All of this based on a code, a language that he gave away. Um, and it's changed the world, literally. And we're doing the same thing. You don't need anything special. We're using Notepad++, which is free. We can use plain old Notepad, we can use Word, we can use whatever to write this code. And we all have the ability then to make a web project. And with a little bit more software and instruction, we'll be able to make an app. Give away an app, sell an app. The barriers to entry nowadays are much lower than they were five, ten years ago to do any of this stuff. So one of the big advancements of HTML was to be able to link documents together. <coughs> right now this document is as a dead end. It just it's here and it doesn't go anywhere else. Most of the times you view a website, you follow one link to go elsewhere. So let's write a little bit of code to add a link from this document to another document. That was the big thing about HTML. Hypertext markup language, a language where you mark hypertext. So on the next, at the end of this line, let's add a break because we want a new line below the picture. So at the end of that line with the image tag, add a break and press enter. And this time we'll write the name of my, we'll write visit VMC Inc. Just like that, not as a web address or anything, just write visit VMC Inc. We're going to make that clickable. We're going to make it an active link. We're going to write code. We're going to mark this as a link. <coughs> So we want the tag that creates a link here. And it would make sense to add the link tag, but don't add the link tag. The link tag is something else. We want the tag that is the A tag, and it has a pair. The A tag, for all intents and purposes, is the link tag. It's an anchor, or think about it as active link. The A tag will make that text active for you to click on. But that's not enough information for the web browser to know where are we going once we click this active link. We need attributes, just like the image tag had an attribute for a picture, and the meta tag had an attribute for car set. We need an attribute for A tag. So let's go inside of the A tag, press space inside of the purple there. Notice again the color coding to help you out inside the A tag. We will add this code, href, hypertext reference. So this is a language originally invented by a nerd for nerds. So now you're nerds because you're writing it. And, uh, href was hypertext reference, a link to another document, equals, quote, end quote. Do you notice that syntax again? Something, some attribute, some value. href attribute, source attribute, car set attribute. So I'm going to write something here for the attribute value, attribute value, attribute value. Syntax, it's the way of the language, the basic structure of language. And inside of href, we'll type my website, complete with HTTP, because it needs the protocol, or else it might not work. So make sure it's got the HTTP <coughs> part. Make sure it's got the HTTP part, or else it might not work. You might think it's a local file. No, it's a file on the web. So we'll protocol. Save it and run it. And if this works, you should have text below my picture active text that when you click it goes to my website. Try it. All right, let's see. So I'm going to save that. Remember always to save. run it, and then you'll see my name, my picture, my link. Click the link. You can tell it's a link because it's underlined in a different color. When you put your mouse on it, of course, you get the, the, you get the finger. 
just going to click that, it goes to my website. Did that work for everyone? href. Make sure it's all spelled right. So the thing about ht, what's it? Your picture might not have worked. Um, let's check. Well, the picture. You want to add a break at the end to give you the new line, br, right here at the end. Now, the the code that we're writing here is um, HTML code. It's some of it is relatively transparent in that it might make sense. Paragraphs, images. Some is a little bit more opaque. What does that tag mean? What does this tag mean? Etc. There's, let's say, just to pick a number, there's 200 tags. There's 200 kinds of code you could use for HTML to do different things. The code that we're writing uh, has a syntax and has a meaning. And this code is taken and then basically translated by the web browser because right now I'm looking at it in Firefox. If I also run it in Chrome, it's the same code, but it might look slightly different. Chrome on the left, Firefox on the right. Looks just about the same. Uh, I think I've aligned it right, but there might be slight, slight differences. You can see those differences more prominently with other examples. But the point is, this HTML code is rather universal, and then it's up to the web browser to translate it, perhaps in its own dialect. So sometimes the code looks a little different per web browser or even per computer. And eventually, this is going to be a mobile project, <coughs> a mobile project. So it might even look a little more different here. <coughs> That's something to think about when we get to that point, because we might be programming our project focused on our particular device, which is a certain 5-inch device, whatever, but then how does it look like on someone else's tablet, or someone's older 4-inch device, or someone's newer 6.5-inch <coughs> device? We have to think about those things as time goes on. And when we get to that point, we will see we'll use these frameworks that will help us with that to be the most universal or responsive to whatever device we're on. And because we've got a lot to learn of tags, we're not going to learn every tag. For the purposes of our project, our end result, we're not going to need to learn every tag. We're going to need to learn the most important ones and the most useful one to us. So what I'm going to show you then, this website that I recommend, go to your web browser. And there's many websites out there for you to learn HTML. Here's one of them. If you go to w3schools.com, w3schools.com, this is one of the many websites out there where you can learn HTML for free. w3schools.com. HTML, the language for building web pages. Learn HTML. Or go look at the reference, a list of every tag what it does, how it's different per, per browser. What I like about this site is you've got various lessons. Learn HTML and then a bunch of lessons. Not only will it give you conceptual stuff, it'll say try it. And when you try it, it'll give you a, a code scratch pad where you'll see here's my code, see the result, and it shows up right there. So we looked at H1, and are you curious? Is there an H2? Maybe. See the results? There is. So anyway, I'm showing you this because this is one of many websites where you can learn this stuff. And what I like about this is go and learn HTML, or CSS, or JavaScript, jQuery, JSON, Angular, PHP, ASP, all of these things, all of these web technologies 
that are important nowadays for free. And you learn, you go through the lessons, and then you have quizzes and certificates. So you can get certificates. These certificates are not college accredited certificates, no, but they are certificates that would be useful for you to brush up on your skills, learn new skills, put on your resume, stuff like that. And this again is one of many sites, but a lot to learn here. You can look up the specifications and the references. HTML tag reference. Every tag listed here alphabetically. So you want to know all about the image tag. And you go there, get examples, write some code, everything. And on this site, at the moment, on the home page, prominently it shows HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Those are the three languages we're going to talk about this month. HTML basically is the code that we're learning for our content layer. Let me make some notes here off, off the page, and I'll put these notes in the folder later on. But the big three pillars, pillars of our project, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. HTML is the content layer. CSS is the presentation layer. And JavaScript is the behavior layer. Those three languages are huge languages. You could teach one class nonstop of a month of each one of them. You can teach one year nonstop on each of them. We have three months to learn as much as we can about all of them, plus the Android stuff, plus the App Store stuff, all of that. So even if you take the full three months, you're not going to be a pro at, any, at, at this at, for, by any means, honestly. I'm going to recommend still further your knowledge in the other classes that we offer go into our front-end web development certificate. That's a big, intense 18-week course where you get really hardcore into it. And so that class, I believe, also uses this book. Again, we're not going to learn every single page of this book. We're going to learn the important things for, the, for our end result. But I'm telling you that there's websites, there's more classes, there's more for you to learn if we don't get to it. Because we're going to need to learn some HTML for our content layer. Basically, that's our structure. and the stuff of our project, the, the text and the paragraphs and the links and the class schedule and all of that, the stuff. Later we'll be talking about CSS, which is our, uh, our design, the design of the project, the colors, the alignment of things, drop shadows, all that visual stuff, the user experience, making your app look different than your neighbor's app, and so forth. And then JavaScript, which is the interaction. Because we can have a great project that is HTML and CSS, but then it really doesn't do much. It's just a business card. It's static. JavaScript allows the interaction. Remember when we went to our to the web version, the web app project, and if you went to the part about enter your name, it asked for your name, captured your name, and displayed your name in all the different pages of the project. Interactivity. If you need a login screen, that could be JavaScript. That whole map thing, the turn-by-turn -turn directions, that's JavaScript. When we talk to a database later, we'll do it through JavaScript. So I would say in order, easy, hard, very hard. That's what I would say. If you get experience in all of these, then they become a little easier. HTML is the easier of all of it, I would say. CSS is getting a little harder, and JavaScript is the hardest one because it's a whole full-featured programming language, object-oriented, and with um, object notation and all of that complex stuff, which we'll get to later. Those are the three big things we're going to talk about in these classes. Any questions on anything so far?
I'm going to go back to the code then. Let's write some more code. I want to write here another uh, bit of content, so more HTML. I want to write a few bullet points of what I want to learn in this class, or what I've learned so far. So I want to add bullet points. We have tags to create bullet points. Back to the code. After this paragraph, let's write on line 18, h2, an h2 pair. Basically, the h tags are to create headings, to create sections in our project. Um, if I pull up the syllabus, it has that concept in that there's a section of my contact information, a section of uh, the recommended book, and so forth. Sections. So I'm dividing different sections with the heading tags. Heading 2. So I'm going to write here what I learned. Next line, we're going to write the p tag. There is no p1, p2, p3, simply because this is my second heading doesn't mean I will add a heading 2. I'll explain that in a moment. But let's write a p tag here, and inside that paragraph we'll write a few concepts from day 1. And then on the next line we'll write bullet points. Let's write a little bit something like this, save it and run it, and explain what we've got going on. So we've got a heading 2, we've got a paragraph. That gets translated then into this. We've got heading 1, and then a section of content, heading 2, and more content. We've got a heading 1 up here because it's the biggest, most important conceptually element on the page. We've got a heading 2 because it's the second largest and it's the second item, largest item on the page. Not simply because it's the second heading, do I add a heading 3? Um, don't write this, but if I was going to have a third section another section, let's say this next section was what I want to learn. Again, don't write this yet, but I would not write H3 here simply because it's the third heading. What that will do is it will create a new section with smaller text. The numbers heading 1, 2, 3, up to 6 create smaller sized text, but still conceptually they are headings, they're like headlines that divide the document. But I'm not simply going to select the heading 3 because it's the third one. I would create that as a, also as a heading 2 because it's the second most important thing on a hierarchy. So see that? These two share the same font size and font weight and everything. They're both the second level of importance. Um, that's why you would mark those as a heading 2 and such. I have an example right here. It's difficult to see from a distance, but on this page, I've got something big and bold at the top, heading 1. And then I've got a subsection right here, heading 2. And I can have another subsection here, also heading 2, because they're conceptually the same level of content. If I had like a subsection of a subsection, that could be a heading 3. That's what the concept of the different headings are. So one beginner mistake that I often see is that people are adding a heading 3, just because it's the third heading, you would add it if it was like a subsection of heading 2. A mistake I also see is that people will write P1, P2, P3. It does not exist. We're only going to have the P tags, plain paragraphs. This will make more sense as time goes on, but just think about that. There's basically a, a tag uh, you've heard of the expression, uh, a thing, 
a place for everything and everything in its place. We have a tag for everything, and you use, well, the metaphor breaks apart. But what I'm trying to say is that you've got the right tag for the right job. That's what I meant. The right tag for the right job. That'll make much more sense and be much more important when we actually get to a more complex project. So I want to create a set of bullet points. We've got a tag for that. I want to create a picture. We've got a tag for that. I want to create text that's big and bold. I want I have a tag for that. So it's the right tag for the right job. I'm saying that <coughs> more for the people that have had experience in HTML before that might have used the wrong tag for the right task. We're going to talk about the right tag for the right task. Inside the paragraph, let's add a new line 21. We've got, a, we've got a tag here to make bullet points. The tag is UL. I'll explain why in a moment. doesn't make sense. I don't understand why that's bullet points. But that has a pair, so we'll break that into two lines. And I'm marking here, start my bullet points, end my bullet points. Again, markup. Most tags have a pair. Inside the UL tag, I'm going to list my first item. What did I learn today? We are making a cross-platform project. This is going to be my first bullet point. I'm going to add many bullet points. But I need to tell it this is my first bullet point, my second, my third, my fourth. So before you finish that sentence, what we want is then an li tag wrapped around my bullet point. This is one bullet point marked with li. I'll explain that in a moment. And that's one bullet point in this group of bullet points, ul. Save it and run it. You should have one bullet point. Make sure you've got your pairs, ul and li. Let's see, so it should look like this. Bullet point. Let's add another bullet point right below it. One more thing that we learned. So right after that first li, press enter, line 23, we're going to add an li pair again. And between the li's, that's an li, not a one, li. Between the li, what's another thing that we learned? Um, month one is basic HTML, CSS, JavaScript. So second bullet point. Go ahead and save it and run it. So the breaks are just the paragraphs. That's a good eye there. We didn't write a pair, we didn't write the break, but um, what you said kind of is true. The break is not necessary here because this code has sort of a break built in. The paragraph doesn't. So here, this is the defaults. The default is that the li will break this between bullet points. Did you get two bullet points? <clears throat> Let's see. <coughs> two bullet points. OK. Yes? If you add a VR, like, would it make a difference? The cool thing is that we can try it, and probably nothing will break. So I'm going to try it. Nothing, nothing really changed. I got a little bit of an extra line. It still worked, but I got an extra line. So we could do that, but I'm going to say we shouldn't do that because we've got other ways to increase our spacing. This is using the wrong tag for the right task. But it doesn't hurt to try it, and if we make a mistake, we just undo it. And I haven't mentioned that if I've forgotten. If you make a mistake with your code and you want to undo it, I haven't mentioned it, but you can go Edit, Undo, just like every software. Control-Z, 
We've also got this undo button. Undo and redo. All right, so I'm going to explain exactly what these tags are doing by showing you this. Go back to UL and slash UL and change this from a UL to an OL and a slash OL. The letter O, not a zero. The letter O. Go back to 21 and 24. If your line numbers don't line up from mine, that's okay. But go back to UL and change it to OL, and then change slash UL to slash OL. Make sure you do both the pair. Just change it, save it, and run it. What happens? Different. Okay, so numbers. Numbers. Here's UL. Here's UL, and then here's OL. Okay, so these numbers, these bullets are in order number one, number two, number infinity. <coughs> ordered list. OL is an ordered list. It's a list of things in an order. Number one, number two, number three, etc. We don't have to write a number here. It's still going to be LI. If I add a new list item, it will automatically give me a number three. Let's write a new list item. What else are we learning today? So li slash li, and we're going to say um, HTML5 is the latest standard. So just another bullet point that gets converted into a number automatically because it's in order, first, second, third, etc. So these lists, these are list items. These are items in a list, list item, li. Doesn't care if it's in an OL ordered list or a UL, which is unordered list, which turns it back to bullet points. This is an example of one of these tags that on the surface doesn't make sense until you know what it is. IMG makes some sense if you never heard of it. IMG it seems like image, okay? But if you've never seen OL, UL, they have no, they, they don't make any sense until you actually type your code. So here, UL is an unordered list, and an OL is an ordered list. This kind of list here, an unordered list would be great for something that doesn't need to be in order, such as a shopping list or an ingredients list. Let's say I'm making a baking app and I want to list my ingredients. So I can create an, a UL, an unordered list. I need eggs, I need butter, I need flour. Doesn't matter what order. But then when we get to the instructions, make sure you mix the flour and the eggs first, and then add the butter. One, two, three. That's when then an OL would work better. Ordered list. Bullet points unordered, numbers ordered. And we can change this later on, because the default is round circles. We can change it to be little squares, or hollowed circles, or little pictures. We can put our company logo there if we wanted. That'll be later. Right now we're dealing with the content of the project, the HTML. Later we'll deal with the presentation of it the design of it, and that's going to be CSS. We'll be able to change the defaults of all of this stuff. CSS, that's the next level. Let's say I wanted to also um,
create another section for more content, but then what I wanted to do was delineate it a little bit more visually, have some sort of visual indicator that this is divided between this and that. So we have a tag that will create a basic simple line that divides the document. So let's say we've got the first section, hello world, then we've got the second section of what I learned. Let's add a new section, but also a divider. So after the paragraph tag, press enter there. And we will write the HR tag. This one has no pair. We're going to type that tag on the next line. We'll write H2 again. Contact us. Again, I wrote H2 because this is now a new section of the same importance as that section. Not a heading 3 because it's the third one. Heading 3 would be if it's like a subsection of heading 2. I haven't explained what HR is yet, so go ahead and type this, save it, and run it. Check the results. If it worked, it should look something like this. There's a divider. There's a horizontal rule. There's a line. HR, horizontal rule. There's a line right <coughs> there, the visual bit of element. And then content this. We can, of course, control. It's too long. I want it to only be half the length of the screen, or I want it to be centered, or I want it to be thick, or whatever. But that's the presentation aspect, the presentation layer. Content layer presentation layer, behavior layer. That's a modern website, a modern app. You separate those three. So on these notes that I was writing over here, three pillars of our project, these three ones, modern practices are to separate. Separate. Are to separate each layer. For example, each kind of code in its own file. So all of our presentation code inside of an HTML file, all of our uh, all, all of our content code inside of an HTML file, all of our presentation code inside of a CSS file, and then all of our behavior code inside of a JavaScript file. So the kind of code for the specific layer in its own file. That's best practice. But what we can do is put them all into one file. There are pros and cons to separating them all, pros and cons to combining them all. We'll talk about it later. But something to think about as we get more advanced, dealing with separate files. We're not always going to be editing this HTML file. We might be in a CSS file, which is linked to the HTML file. We might be writing code in a JavaScript file, linked to the HTML file. So any of that presentation that we want to do, the changes to the look of things, we'll have to wait a little bit for next time to change colors and such. We'll get to it. We're still writing a little bit of content. Let's go back to the code. Contact us. I have tags to create a contact form. I want someone to send me a message. I can create that code right now. Under contact us, let's press enter and press tab. We'll type a tag called form. Not forum, form. And that has a pair. We're about to create a form, a feedback form, a contact form. There's a tag for a task, the right tag for the right task.
inside of line 30. We're going to ask for the person's uh, name, um, email, and their message. And then they'll be able to contact us. So we're going to ask for their name first. And we have a tag here, the label tag, which has a pair. Because when you're filling out a form, most likely next to it, there's a little label next to it that tells you what that box, what you should fill in that box. So inside of label, we will say name colon space. This is visual. This is going to show up for people. Notice everything else that's a tag is lowercase, but anything that's uppercase or regular case usually is seen by people. So the person will see this. It'll say name. This is a label for a box for someone to type their name. So on the same line here, we will type the input tag and input is one of them that doesn't have a pair, but it has attributes. The attribute is a type equals. We have some sort of input, some way to collect information. We're asking for the person's name. We want them to input their name into a box of type text. We're going to capture text here. We're asking for a person to type their name. This label needs to be associated with this input box. So actually we need to fine-tune our code here. This should work, but it should be typed a little bit more accurately, more specifically. Let's back up to where we've got the label tag, the first label tag there, and we're going to add an attribute to the label tag. So add a space inside of the label tag. We'll type for. We're adding another attribute. For. This label is for something. Equals quote unquote. Same sort of syntax. You see that over and over? Some sort of attribute, some sort of value. For. This label is for that input box. And that input box, we will call it, um, let's just call it user name. That's lowercase. Here we're saying this, this, this word name is attached, it's a label that's attached to, it's used for that input box. But it's not quite complete yet either because this input box doesn't know that we mean this label, and vice versa. So we need, on the input box, at the end we've got type, text, and then we want, at the end there, still inside the angle brackets, this is inside of the input tag, name equals quotes. And it's the same username. This label is being used for something named username. This is the something named username. So I'll go ahead and type username inside of input. So that's a much better formed bit of code there. Um, as I'm saying, we need to be specific. Sometimes close enough works, but we should be specific so that it works exactly how we expect. So let's say that I run it. You should get on screen, it should say name, and then a box <laughs> for you to type your name. All of that code to get those two basic things, but we need to type sometimes very specifically to get exactly what we're expecting. Let's see if mine worked. All of that code that we wrote looks like that, translated. It's asking for a name. Why don't you type, try typing your name in there? It is a box. 
an input box where you can type text. John Q public. <coughs> write text. It's an input box. Did that work for everyone? Anyone need some help? Whenever you've seen any sort of input box, perhaps let me ask you, what's the most common input box that you might see in your web travels? Email, email search, yes. A login, password and such. So we'll be able to create those things. But usually when you have one of those types of input boxes, what else do you have? Button. Button. Go. Submit. Send some button that actually <coughs> does something. So we're not quite there yet. We're building our form. And so far we're asking for an input box. <coughs> have you noticed that oftentimes you have some sort of input box and there's placeholder text. There's text in here that tells you what to write or how to write it. Let's add that, then we'll add, we'll add another box. We've got also an attribute for the input tag. Go back to your input tag. We've said this is an input element of type text. It accepts text. Its name is username. But we're going to then add placeholder text so that the person knows what to write. So we will add here still another attribute inside the angle bracket space this one makes sense. Placeholder <coughs> equals quote end quote. And right here we can write, for example, last name, first name. <coughs> so the placeholder attribute was added to the input box, and in the quotes we're displaying what should display on screen, last name, first name. And when you type, uh, when you click there, it goes away, and now you can type last name, first name. Now as we create our project, we're going to be using the latest standards, HTML5, CSS3, and JavaScript EC6. And so notice here in our code, type is red, name is red, but placeholder is not red. That doesn't mean it's wrong. And like I said before, just because something is red doesn't mean it's wrong. Something is blue doesn't mean it's right. It's just the way Notepad++ color codes things. We can change that color coding. But the point is, look at your color coding, and as most often, as most often as you can, make sure yours lines up with mine, because I assume mine is right. And if you look at your code and my code in the lineup, then yours is probably right as well. So don't worry that that's not red like the others. It's just that this is a more modern, this is an HTML5 construct that perhaps Notepad++ doesn't recognize yet. It recognizes name, which is HTML4, probably HTML2.0, but placeholder is HTML5. It's the latest one. So that might also mean that on some web browsers, that placeholder might not make sense to that web browser. If we've got, if we've got an old web browser, old enough, no, if we had like an old web browser, that might, the web browser might not understand it and might not put anything there. And that's okay. We're going to be learning the modern stuff, but if the modern stuff doesn't work, we still want a project that works for older devices. We want to be backwards compatible. So that's a little icing on the cake. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, that's okay. But let's say I want to capture two more things. I want to capture an email address. I want to give them a little bit of space to write a comment and then the send button. So let's do in the same sort of syntax the next line. We need a label and we need an input. So let's write the basic syn syn syntax. We'll write label open, close, tags, and we'll write input. That's our basic syntax. Some sort of text for the user and some sort of input element. <clears throat> I 
I already know that I'm going to have some text on screen like before, so I'll back up to label and give that a for attribute. We'll call this uh, user email. We had label for username, and this was named username. So here, label for user email, that input box should have a name of user email. Question. So the user, the username and user email, is that like an attribute? Those are attributes. For is the attribute technically, and the and this is the attribute value. So if we put email address, would it still function correctly? Yes. Of user email? Mm -hmm. If we had some other name here, as long as it was consistent in both places, it would work. Okay. This is the reserved word, but this we can make up ourselves. And I'll try to point it out as much as possible where it's where it's reserved and you have to do it and where we can make it up. But good point there. Most of the code that we're writing, these are tags that are reserved. They exist. But on some, we can make it up, like that one, actually. So user email, I just made it up. That could be called anything. My email. <coughs> the email. Try this. Um, double click the word user mail. It should select it. Notepad plus plus when you double click some tag, it selects it. And notice it also selects other instances of the same one. That's very useful because if I've written user mail ten times in my project, if I do a double click on user mail, everywhere in my project it will highlight. It'll highlight green. So I can quickly scroll through it and find that's what I'm looking for. So notice if you if you double click the P tag, it highlighted right there, right there, right there, right there, everywhere in the project. That may not seem very valuable at the moment, but it's going to be very valuable once we have 200 lines of code, 500 lines of code, 1,000 lines of code. When we get more advanced, we will also see why the find feature is so valuable. But we're not there yet. So we wrote user mail. And I use this a lot to check my code because, um, you know, I'm writing my code and I'm writing a lot and, I, and it's running and suddenly it doesn't work anymore. I made a mistake. I'm looking, I'm looking, what's my problem? One of the ways that I troubleshoot my code is if I'm expecting something to work a certain way, you know, I select the code. Why isn't the other user mail highlighting anymore? Misspelled it. I spelled user mail instead of user mail. So that one didn't highlight its pair because I misspelled it. So there's going to be these little debugging tips that I'm going to be mentioning. And just about every code editor has some aspect of this. Syntax highlighting, code collapsing, color coding, all of that stuff. So that was our basic uh, structure. We need label. We're going to ask for the person's email. So between the label tags, <coughs> this is the human readable thing. So we'll type email, colon. When we get a little bit more advanced, so don't worry about it just yet, but it will matter sometimes the order of some of these attributes. So we wrote four right here. Over here we wrote type and then name. Right here I might write name and then type. It'll probably work fine, but sometimes the order matters. And I'll point it out at times when it does matter. I want to be consistent. However, I want to learn these concepts and be consistent. So I'm going to be consistent in that I'm going to add type first and then name. It probably won't matter at this point, but I want to be consistent. So I'll go over here and add type, quotes, and then username email. I believe we have a type of email. The most modern browsers understand that. Let's try it. If it doesn't work, it'll just work by default. But if if we want it to be more cross-platform, we could keep that as simply text, any text. 
this works better on a mobile device. Mobile devices often have the most modern uh, browsers, so therefore they understand the latest code. If I try to use type email on an older web browser, it might not understand, but in theory, of type email should only let us write an email address there. We're not going to see much difference here. It's still going to let us write anything. Anything at anything.com. But uh, that's got an input box to accept an email address. That text is attached to that input box. I didn't put a placeholder, but I could. You can put a placeholder if you want. Notice here, I wrote name, I wrote email. You see any difference between what I wrote on email here and what I wrote on name? It's very subtle. Space. So some of you that might have a more discerning graphic design eye saw that and, and, and it damaged you deeply, and some of you <coughs> didn't notice it, I don't care. But I noticed it. No space there. I have no space there. I don't have the graphic. <laughs> but you have a design, you have an eye for code. Yeah. So, no big deal, but it would be for some, especially user user interface design, it does, does it look like it's supposed to and such. On a technical level, it works, but on a user interface design aspect, I've got a space there, no space there, I want a space there to be consistent. I did not write a space there. I wrote a space on that one. See that? I wrote a space right there. I didn't write a space here. Space. Functionally, the it'll still work, but now design-wise, it's designed a little better. And even though I separated these into different lines, didn't separate it into different lines here. So it needs a break. Line 30, if you'd like, at the end I will add a break, and if you would like to do it, I won't do it, but if you'd like to do it, you can add the placeholder. Placeholder will also work there. So with that break now, I've got to like that. One more box, and then a send button. Um, so next line over, same syntax. We need a label and we need an input. And I would recommend, even though even though we know what we're, we're about to type, when I teach programming, I recommend to always complete your pairs. What I'm saying is, I could start writing label and for, blah, 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 and then comment and such and then I might forget to close my label tag and I get started on my input tag so I started my label tag I never closed my label tag and I started my input tag that could break my project because the funny thing about HTML is that on the one hand it's very loosey-goosey and on the other hand it's very strict it just depends on the on the context sometimes if you don't write the code right it'll work Sometimes you don't write the code right, the whole thing breaks, tragically. So what I'm trying to say is when I teach co programming, I try to always do the pairs of things. I know I'm going to write label 4. I know I'm going to write input type. But I'm still going to close my pairs of things so that I don't forget to close them. Some code editors will close your tags for you. Some won't. Um, for some reason, our version of Notepad here doesn't have the option turned on that it will close your tags. But that's okay. Sometimes it's better to do it the hard way, and once you're comfortable with the hard way, then you can do the easy way. But I want the label and I want the input field. I will add another four tag, uh, four attribute. And this one we'll call, again, this could be whatever we want, but I've been consistently calling them user something. So we'll be for the box called user comment. And inside the label, we'll say comment, colon space. <coughs> Get 
the label for a box. There's our box input. It needs the same name as this for attribute. So to your input tag, add the name attribute. Uh, and then the attribute value, user comment. So we don't do input type, we do input name? No, we will do input type. I'm just being consistent with what I've written before. That Before I forget, because I've got four, okay. I want to make sure I've got its name. I don't want to forget it, so I write it by right the way. Now I'm going to say what kind of type, because I do have to say what input type. There's like 12 of them, so I need to say which type. I believe this one is, uh, let me check it and then I'll confirm. I believe this one is text area. I don't have them all memorized, even though it seems like I do. Text area, uh, text field. This one, I, I'm forgetting it, but um, we'll do text area. Ten points extra credit if you find it out. But um, this is text area. We're asking for a user comment. Type of text area. I think I'm missing one little thing, but that's OK. Text area, save it and run it. email name comment. I could add a placeholder to that as well. I can make it say, we'd love to hear back from you. And then it goes away when you person clicks on it and you start to type. Text area. But it's a tag, it's not the attribute. Yeah, it's a tag. The text area. The rows and columns. As a rows and columns, okay. Text area. So it's the multi-line input control area. So there's different ways to do that one you see there. If instead of doing input, we do text area, that I want to do here, what's that one? Is it row or rows? So you see, you can look it up. You don't have to, the point of this is you don't have to have everything memorized. You can always, of course, look it up. Okay, so it is text area rows and columns. Okay. So you don't have to have everything memorized. You can easily look it up. So it should be like this. Instead of this whole input box, I'm going to delete it. You want text area tag, which has a pair. Okay, what I'm trying to get at is text area, and then this time we've got the attribute rows 5, name, user, comment. And that one's a little different. It's not an input. It's a text area with a pair. Two attributes. Save it and run it. What I'm getting at is I was, I was trying to make a little box where you can write multiple lines of a comment. 
the regular input type of text is just one box for one line of feedback. This one of text area, I've said give me give the user five rows for them to write something, a little paragraph. And then the result looks like that. So I deleted the code that we wrote and I replaced it with text area, one word, lowercase, and it's pair, slash text area, nothing in between the text. So if you've got it working, it should look something like this. Name, email, comment. Hmm, I had such great alignment right here, and he's lined up really nice. Now this one's over here, I want to line that up there. And this is down here, I want it up here. Don't worry about that yet. That would be when we get to CSS. This is the content, the structure. Then I want to deal with the alignment and the padding and the color and all of that, that's CSS. That'll be a little later. But all of these things are a puzzle that come together. I, don't, I lost my, uh, my comment box. I'll check you just one moment. Let me finish one thought here and then I'll help you right here. Let's say we've got it working and then we want the send button, the submit button. Let's do that one more and then we'll wrap up our form. Let's go after this line did you notice also I added a break? I forgot to mention, but I added a break after user mail. I'm going to add a break after this text area. So on the next line, we want a send button. Different ways to do this. Let's do it this way, just to be consistent. Input, type, submit. Uh, content equals send. So we've got a little different. We didn't need a label because the label over here was working for some text next to the input field, right? This one doesn't need any extra text. The text is right on the button, and so we've got an input. It doesn't make it doesn't quite. I wouldn't quite think of it as an as an input, but then we say input of type submit. This is a submit button. And if we didn't add anything extra, it would say submit query, you know, really mechanical. So I changed it to make the button say send value. The value of the submit input element is send. And that can be uppercase, lowercase, whatever. I can say send it. So send it. So this value is what's inside the button. So this looks like the forms that I've seen before. Perhaps I'm going to put in my last name, first name, I'm going to put in my email, I'm going to put a comment, great site. I want to hire you, and then send it. Did it send it? 
my phone didn't ring. Did I get it? I didn't tell it where to go. I didn't tell it what to do. I didn't add any JavaScript to make this work. This is just a placeholder. This this is just structure. It has no no result. That's JavaScript. That's the behavior layer. JavaScript or some other code, PHP, CGI, ASP, etc., some other code, some other language, would then capture all of this information, create an email, send an email, and then I would get the email. We're not going to get that far tonight, but that would be the next level. We've got HTML for the content. This is HTML. I want to align those things nice and pretty. That's CSS. I want it to actually work. That's JavaScript. That's a modern website, those three languages, and other, other ones, ancillary. But those three languages also will be what we will want for our web app, our whole project. And eventually that will be an Android app. Obviously much prettier than this, but with these languages we're going to make that Android app, that iPhone app, etc. Let's take one last quick break. When we come back we'll do one more thing and then we'll wrap it up. It's 8.53. Let's just take a break until 9, and when we come back at 9, we'll do one more little thing.